So I think we're ready to start. So next talk is uh, from Martin about Debian or ARM devices. Um, so so it's, uh, it's De Debian on, on ARM devices. So it's not about the, the Debian ARM port itself or, or one of the various ARM ports. Uh, it's, uh, I would say it's sort of a mix of, of different topics. Um, it, it's basically, I, I mean, ba basically I, I often get the, the question from, from users, well, Debian works on this particular ARM device. I have a device which is like really, really similar. So surely Debian should work on it, right? And, and so far the answer unfortunately usually was no. Um, and, and, and that's really frustrating for users um, because they don't see why. You know, the device is pretty much the same, so why doesn't it just work? And, and so basically what I'm trying to do is, is to show like a little bit behind the scenes of how Debian on ARM works. Um, and, and there has been a lot of progress. Um, so I was gonna show how, how did it work, what are the improvements and, and how is it gonna work in the future? Um, and it's sort of from a, more from a developer perspective, like how, how do we support ARM in, in the Debian install as well? So it's like a, 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 a mix of, of stuff. And I should say, um, I, I'm, I'm really looking at it from someone who basically adds support for ARM devices in the installer, but I'm, I'm not a, like a kernel guy or anything, so there are a lot of people in this room who know like way more about the technical details, but I'm, I'm not gonna really drill down very, very deep anyway. But if, if I'm incorrect, I'm sure there are plenty of people who will correct me. Um, so, so where where do you find ARM? Um, and and pr pretty much it's it's everywhere the, these days. I mean, pr pretty much every fo every phone has has an ARM chip in it. Um, uh, all those Internet of Things gadgets, a, a lot of them are ARM based. Uh, you have uh, NAS devices, and and that's really the area that I used to focus on. Um, those, those small boxes where you basically add a hard drive and, and most people just use it for storage, but for us it's actually a, you know, a full PC where you can install Debian on it. Um, so I, I always found that to be very interesting. Um, and nowadays you have a lot of um, development boards, um, and I'm, I'm actually not sure if development board is, is the right word, because when I hear development board, I think of these like really expensive, uh, like 5K boards or something. Um, but nowadays you have those, maybe a better word would be like bare boards, like Raspberry Pi, where you basically you just buy the board. It doesn't come with a case, even though you can, you can buy those as well. And it's like $30 or something you, you, can, you can get. And, and I think that's really where most of the, the, the excitement is, is going on for, for, for Debian users at the moment. Um, and, and also a lot of the frustration, I, I should add. And, and Everyone says that you know ARM is going to be big on servers, um, and 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 I think that's something we we gonna see. Um, but right now, it, again, it's it's a little bit frustrating. Um, so how how does it work? Uh, so Debian installer, uh, there are basically two big d different ways to install on on those ARM type devices. So the like the historically the, the normal way would be to install on like a screen. Um, so that can be a serial console uh, or it could be a real monitor with, with mouse and, and keyboard. Um, and then you, you just download via the network or from a, a CD image or whatever. Um, but the other, the other method which we actually used for a lot of those NAS devices was a uh, network console where you basically SSH into the installer uh, and you perform the installation via SSH. Um, and, and, and that was really the, the only way because those NAS devices don't, don't have any, any input output. So um, even, even though you can uh, attach a serial console to most of them, that's something we didn't want to require from the user. Um, and the other thing that's coming soon, I think it was actually committed today, is, is screen support. So basically, uh, that you can you can have multiple sessions within DI, which which can be useful if you if you want to you know open a shell to debug. Um, but so how and so this is really about looking back at like running Debian on NAS devices, which is something that used to be really popular. Um, and and the the way it worked was basically 
that we provided a, a installer image with, which was sort of a, a firmware image. So a lot of those Nest devices have like a, a firmware upgrade mechanism. And so we would basically fake, uh, we would create a, a firmware image which the software would accept, um, but instead of a, a firmware update, it would actually contain Debian installer. So you would you know, install that upgrade, uh, you would reboot and you could SSH to the installer. Um, and obviously in order to SSH to, to the installer, it needs to bring up the network. Um, so there is a tool called OldSys Pre-Seed, which basically reads the network configuration from the device um, and, and sets up the, net, the networking. Um, and, and it can obviously can also do DHCP. And then the user connects via SSH. Again, um, th there would be some indication, maybe the, you know, there would be a beeper, or maybe change the LED to indicate that the installer is ready. Um, and then the, the user basically performs just a regular installation. Uh, it's just normal DI. They don't have to do anything differently. Um, and at the end, Flash Kernel runs uh, to, make, to make the system bootable. Um, so Flash Kernel uh, is called that way because it, it, it used to support, uh, like the initial device, it supported uh, booted from Flash, but it also generates bootable, device, uh, bootable images on disk for devices that need that. Um, so it, it really, Flash Kernel really uh, requires understanding of each device. Um, and our, our philosophy in those cases with those NAS devices was really, we, we, not, we don't touch anything in, in the firmware, like in the configuration. So sometimes we have to hack around stuff. So uh, instead of changing the, the root device in, in the U-boot config, we would actually hard code that in, in the RAM disk. Um, just be, because we wanted people to go back to the original form, firmware if they had to. For example, if they had to send it in for a repair or something. Um, and, and, and that kind of approach really worked well. Um, so I think we, we really had a lot of people, a, a lot of users running Debian on, on those kind of NAS devices. And it was really easy to do. Um, you get a firmware image, you connect to the installer via SSH, and, and it just works. It's a normal you know, Debian installer, the way everyone knows it. Um, because some of the other distros, they basically provide like tarballs and instructions. So you need to partition the disk, you need to you know, untar it, you need to change those files. And even though that sounds simple, it's so many steps that you always, you often get something wrong and, and then you put the, the, the drive into the Nest device and it doesn't boot and you don't know why. So where, where did you make that mistake, you know, which step? And you basically have to start from scratch. So I think Debian really provided something unique by, by adding, you know, by having that Debian installer support. Um, but anyway, so that's the way it, it, it sort of used to work. Nowadays, with a lot of those spare boards, it's, it's much easier, um, but I, I will get to that. Um, so at the moment, there are three different ARM ports. There is the old ARM EL, which used to be the, the new ARM EL, <laughs> um, but now it's old. And, and one of the discussions we're probably gonna have later today in the BOF is about, you know, should we remove that uh, after stretch? Um, there is ARM H, F, and the ARM 64. Um, and so that's basically the question I'm hoping to answer. So if, you know, device A works, I have a device which is really similar, but it, it doesn't work. Why, why is that? Um, so, so there have been a, a lot of changes um, in, in various upstream um, projects, especially um, the kernel and U-boot that really made things easier. Um, so in, in the past, um, we, we basically uh, had uh, a kernel image for each platform, where a platform is basically like a SOC family, um, and they would need a different image. Um, and, and because ARM take, you know, it takes a long time to compile, there was always some debate about adding a new, a new platform, um, because there would be a new image flavor, which, which takes some time. Um, and, and that was just really, like you couldn't, you couldn't just have one ARM kernel which, which works everywhere. Um, and, and a lot of people didn't understand that, so why do you have those different kernels, those different platforms? Um, but, but there has been a, a lot of progress uh, upstream, and basically nowadays with, with ARM HF and with, with, with ARM 64, you really just have one kernel. Um, and, and upstream basically 
maybe maybe some of you remember the the rant by by Linus about you know the, the armed people doing everything in different ways, and there has been a lot of standardization over the years. Um, and, and basically, the other thing was is so there used to be for each device uh, there was a board file, it was like a C file uh, to initialize the, the different components, um, and the bootloader would boot uh, would pass a machine ID to the kernel, and then it it would load that boot file. Um, and nowadays, there is basically a, a device tree in in the kernel, which is a, a description of the <coughs> hardware. Um, and, and then you basically compile that to like a binary plot, the DTP, B. Um, and so basically you just need the kernel image um, and that DTP, which is hardware specific, and then, and then it boots. Um, so, and, and obviously for us in Debian, that makes it much, much easier to support you know, a, a lot of devices. Um, the, the other thing that changed in U-boot um, when, when you install the, the Debian kernel image, it creates you know, the, the VM uh, Linux file on, in, in boot and also the RAM disk. Um, but with U-boot, you couldn't actually load those files directly. Uh, you basically had to wrap them in, in a U-boot image. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not really hard. It's just a, a command you need to run. Um, but, but all of the different devices had different load addresses. Um, so again, that's hardware-specific knowledge that, that Flash kernel needed to know. And nowadays, um, there is a command where, which can just directly load the kernel. Um, so that, again, was a step to make things easier. And the, the last uh, thing which, which really made things easier is distro support um, in U-boot. Um, so basically, in, in the past, every U-boot, every device using U-boot would boot in, in a different way. Um, just in, in ter terms of you know the where would it load the file from or what kind of variables it would use, and nowadays the, there is something called distro support, which is basically a standardized way to boot a Linux distro um, with with uboot. Um, and there are basically two ways: either it can it can read a, a config file, uh, or it can basically run a, a boot script, and and that's what we use in in Debian. So we basically have a a generic boot script uh, which you know, loads the kernel, loads the RAM disk, the DTP, and, and boots Debian. And we, we can use that generic boot script on almost all of the modern devices. So, so nowadays, because of that, it's much more standard and, and it's much easier to, to support those um, <coughs> devices. Um, so here are some examples from Flash kernel. Um, so basically, Flash Kernel has like a database of devices which it supports. Um, so it's like the, the machine entry from Brock CPU info. Um, and then the kernel flavors, it, it can run. And so this one is an is a old device, so it still uses a board file. Um, and it, it, it needs that U-boot wrapper. Um, so you're basically setting the, the machine ID. Uh, those are the, the flash petitions where the, the kernel and the, the RAM disk are stored, and that's that load address for the, the U-boot wrapper. Um, and, and now, and that's a device which used to, to have a boot file, um, and which then migrated to a DTP. And so basically, uh, so that was really, really, really painful for Debian. Um, so basically, the kernel people said, oh, we're going to move to a device tree, but don't worry, we're not going to remove those old board files. You can still use them. Um, and then a, a few years later, they realized you know, it's really hard to keep both alive. And, and they got rid of the board files. And, and that was really painful for, for us because we had to, to migrate. Um, and so you can see here uh, like a, a kernel version. And so from that kernel on, uh, you need to, to use the, the new way. Um, and, and one of the reasons it was, it was painful, uh, especially on, on the QNAP devices, is because with, uh, the, they actually have two different CPUs. There, there are different variants. Um, and with the board files, the same board file worked regardless of the CPU. But, but because of the way device tree works, you actually needed two different device trees depending on, on the CPU. 
And, and so now we, we basically, you know, something which just worked, you know, it used to work fine. Uh, you just had one kernel, uh, you know, with that machine ID, things would work. And, and suddenly with, with the device tree, we need to figure out well, which one do you need. Um, and so Ian Campbell fortunately did, did all of that work. Um, so that's actually a script that runs to figure out which, which device tree that particular device needs. Um, and, and, and so now, so that's actually the reason I, I want to show that is how simple things are these days. So this is a, a example of a modern platform uh, which uses distro support. So the, the only thing you, you really need is a machine entry with the name um, and, then, and then like the kernel flavor, but that's the same for, you know, there is only one kernel flavor. Um, and, and then the device tree ID, and again, all of that stuff is generic. So it just uses the generic boot script um, in the generic boot path. Um, so basically, all you pretty much need for a new device now is like, you know, these two entries. Um, so it's really, really simple. Um, so here, I just wanted to talk about the different ARM ports and, and so for me it was really hard to structure this because those changes in, in the kernel and, and you put, you know, happened independent of our ARM ports. Um, but at the same time, because the, the ARM HF one is much newer, it, it works in a different way. Um, so, so basically with ARM EL, um, so uh, we still have different flavors, um, but we were able to combine the, the Orion and the Kirkwood into one Marvel flavor. Um, and then we have the versatile one. Um, and so one of the problems we have on ARM EL is that a lot of those Nest devices are put from flash and they only have, uh, some of them only have two megabytes for the kernel, um, which used to be a, a lot of space, but nowadays it's not. Um, so that really uh, puts a lot of restrictions. So we basically disabled some stuff on ARM EL. Um, but ARM EL, I think, is really, really widely used um, because of those Nest devices. So I think they are slowly getting old, but there are still a lot of people who use them. Um, like I said, it requires that you put image. Um, and originally, we used board files and the device tree, um, but now most of them have switched over to device tree, um, even though some of them still use board files. Um, and adding a new device requires a, a number of changes in the installer. So basically, uh, you needed to map the, the device to the, the boot image. Um, and, and there were just a, a couple of, of, of things. So basically, adding one device, you had to change like five different places in the installer. And, and it was quite confusing for, for people who wanted to edit new devices, because that wasn't really documented very well. Um, and so some examples are listed here, and, and people who are involved in, in that part. And, um, so Roger is actually someone who is he's quite new, and he really got in, involved in supporting those old devices. Um, and so ARM HF is, is much nicer. Um, so the much majority of, of devices support that distro support. Um, and the, the other thing we do um, is for some of the devices, we provide uh, SD card images, which contain U-boot and uh, the, the Debian installer. Um, so basically, Vagrant maintains U-Boot in, in Debian, and, and a lot of those devices are supported in, in, in U-Boot in Debian. Um, and, and so we just provide an ST image, so you can just store that to the SD card, you put it in, um, and because of that distro support, it just loads Debian installer. Uh, you, you do the in installation, you reboot, and things just work. Um, so, so I think it, it really has gone uh, you know, uh, come a, a, a long way. Um, yeah, and so nowadays, adding a new device requires much fewer changes than, than, than it used to be, um, because it use, everything uses the same, like one kernel flavor. You don't need to touch all those different places anymore. Um, and, and because of distro support, it, it, it just works. It can, it can pretty much use the generic um, boot script. 
Um, so I'm 64. Um, so the, the problem until recently is that there simply wasn't any hardware that people could buy. Um, and, and it's changing rapidly now, um, even though it's still not ideal. So you have, for example, the Raspberry Pi 3, uh, which uses a 64-bit uh, CPU, uh, but the software they ship is only 32-bit. Um, but mo most of the work uh, is now upstream to, to run 64-bit on it. Um, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of a lot of devices which sort of work, but not quite. Um, but any, anyway, so the idea for ARM64 is that a, a lot of the the new hardware, especially on the server side, would use UEFI, um, and so you basically just it just works like a PC. So you have Grub, um, you can store, you, you can run Debian installer from Grub. And then you get Grub afterwards, and it just boots like, like a PC. And, and Steve has, has done a, a lot of work in that area. And in theory, it, it, it should just work out of the box. Um, so if, if it uses U, UEFI, we don't need to add anything. It, it, it just works. Uh, there is nothing to do. Um, at, at least that's the theory. So what I found is, uh, so I, I made the disclaimer, assume, assuming the kernel, you know, kernel support and stuff, and I, I, to be honest, right now, that's a, a big assumption. Um, so I've, I've been playing with a few 64-bit uh, ARM boards. And, and basically, what I found is uh, there is some support upstream. So I can boot a kernel. But oh, there is no USB support. There is no Wi-Fi support. So I, I can't actually do any, anything with it. Um, but, I, I, but I, I think that's just something that's because ARM64 is still rep, uh, fairly new. Um, and there is a lot of work going on upstream to support the, the various platforms. So I, I think over time, that's really going to be much better. Um, but ev even though that UEFI idea is there, uh, in reality, we're going to see different solutions on ARM64. Um, so we are going to see UEFI, in particular on servers, um, but we also see U-boot. Um, so a lot of those bare boards, they, they have U-boot. Um, and, and so right now, we can use that distro support. And, and I, I, I think it works really well. Um, but one thing that SUSE has done, so they, they basically have the same issue. They want to support all those devices, but they just want to use the same mechanism everywhere. So they've actually implemented UEFI on top of, of U-boot. So you can basically use U-boot to load Grub, um, and, and then you, you, you have Grub. So I think that's something we need to figure out. Um, do we want to stay with distro support? Do we want to use UEFI on top of U-boot? Uh, Is that something we want to you know, give users the option? Um, and then uh, Fastboot uh, is, is something used on, in the Android world. And, and a lot of those, like I see a lot of well, both bare ports, but also game consoles and stuff, which, which are sort of Android oriented, but you can also run normal Linux. Um, and they would use like fast boot or something. And there are like a tons of other bootloaders out there. Um, but I, I would definitely say like the big ones are UEFI and, and U-boot. Um, so I, I gave a similar talk a few weeks ago, and, and someone asked, so what about non-free firmware? Like, can I? Can I run that stuff you know, purely with, with free software? And um, so the thing with ARM is there, there are a lot of different platforms. So I'm, I'm not sure about all of them. Um, but some of the platforms I looked at, yeah, you, you, you do need some. There is always something proprietary. Um, so uh, in a lot of cases, I see where you have at least a proprietary, like a first stage bootloader. Um, so Raspberry Pi is an example. So I, I don't actually have a Raspberry Pi, but the way I understand it is you basically put some boot files on an SD card, um, and they are proprietary, and then they load the, the kernel. Or in, in case of when we support it in Debian, we, that first stage bootloader would basically be used to run U-boot, um, and then we can use U-boot. And, and the U-boot uh, support, all of that is, is free software. Um, but that first stage bootloader isn't. I, I've heard that the, there are some people working on a free replacement for, for the Raspberry Pi, though. Um, 
with NVIDIA Tegra, uh, which is uh, something I'm working on at the moment, you also have a tiny first stage bootloader. Um, but then again, you have uBoot, which, which is free. And in that case, you also have some firmware images for the, the GPU um, and, for, and for some other stuff. Uh, for the Dragon Board, so the Dragon Board sounded <laughs> really interesting um, because it actually has a, 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 a graphics chip which, which can be used with free software. Um, so that sounded pretty cool. Um, but again, it, it has a, a proprietary uh, first stage bootloader. And then there is a second stage bootloader, which, which is actually open source. Um, and then there is actually uh, U-boot as well. Um, and then you have some binary blobs, which uh, also need to be stored in Flash to, to work properly. On the Marvel side, I'm not really aware of anything. Um, I've never needed to Flash anything proprietary, but I'm not sure how you would get started on, on Marvel. So maybe there is something. Um, so the, the future, so, um, so Nest devices, uh, are, like I said, that's been something that's really been popular in Debian. Um, especially on, on the QNAP devices. So the problem is, the, so QNAP, so the devices we currently support are, are pretty old nowadays. Um, and they have some, some newer devices, but um, they are not properly supported in the upstream kernel. Um, so I, I have no plans to support Debian on those. Um, I, I recently did some work on some Seagate NAS devices, uh, which actually pretty in interesting. Um, but again, they're a little bit out of date already. Um, and then there is the whole 64-bit ARM. So I think people are really waiting for proper ARM64 servers. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of work in, in, in that area. Um, and then there are all those development boards, um, Raspberry Pi, uh, Pine64, all window. Um, Basically, all of them sound exciting, but if you if you look at them, all of them have have some upstream issues. So it's it is really quite frustrating at, at the moment. But but I, I think things are, are really moving quite rapidly. Um, and then there is this 96 board initiative, uh, which is actually done by Linaro, and and so Linaro su supports Linux on ARM. So you would think, wow, you know, there are some really nice boards coming out. Um, and they differentiate between the consumer edition and the enterprise edition. And so I, I bought some consumer edition boards, and, and it's, it's, it's really horrible. So first of all, I had to spend like half a day just getting the components, because it uses like a non-standard power supply, a non-standard serial console. Um, so finally, I found all the pieces I needed. And then I was expecting, well, it's from the Naro, so surely everything just works upstream. Um, but it doesn't. It was like, yeah, I can boot the Linux kernel, but there is no USB, there is no you know, Wi-Fi, no nothing. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit frustrating. On the enterprise edition, I think that looks more interesting. I think that's more standardized. Um, but, but again, there have been some delays. Um, the code is all upstream except for PCI. Yeah. Already. Okay. Yeah. So. So that would be interesting to see. So the, the questions that I actually have nowadays is, is so because of those changes, because of you know, having you know, a modern U-boot on most of those new devices, having a U-boot with distro support, having a kernel which, uh, you know, one kernel image which works on all those devices which are supported, it's really easy to support you know, a new device uh, as long as it's supported by the kernel. But at the same time, I think that's a big challenge for Debian. Because so right now, if you look at ARMHF, we basically say, well, take, take the installer. Um, and if there is a device tree, it's probably going to work. Um, but what, what does that mean, right? Um, and, and on the one hand, we have some devices which really work, which means so we have you know, Vagrant uh, having U-boot support in, in Debian. Uh, we have people testing Debian installer, testing the Debian kernel. So we have devices which are really well supported. Um, and then we have some devices, on the other hand, where, well, yes, there is a device tree, but no one has ever tried it. Um, and at the moment, we have no way for users to differentiate 
those use case, like those you know, support levels. Um, so, so I'm wondering if we need like a, a table uh, somewhere where, where, and maybe some support levels, like green, yellow, uh, red. Like green is, yeah, we have Debian people who, have, who, are, who are testing that stuff. Yellow would be where we have heard some reports that it might work. And green is either it doesn't work or we haven't heard that it works. Maybe we need something like that. Um, but, but right now, I, I see from users, uh, you know, like I, I want to run Debian on my ARM device, and they don't know if, if, it, if it's going to work. Yeah, Ben. Yeah. You also want to Good. Yeah, so Ben, ben is saying we also need to track what's the, the earliest and the latest kernel version that, that has been tested. Yeah, so I, I think we really need to come up with some criteria to, to have, you know, de define those kind of support levels and indicate that. Um, and yeah, the, the other question is related. So with all those boards, how, we, how do we actually test them? So I, I, I keep, and, and it's really, what, what, one of the things which is great, but also annoying with those boards, they're so cheap. So it's like, oh, there's a new board. It's like 30 bucks. Oh, I, I just get it. And then you have like those pile of boards and you realize, well, I don't have time to test all of that stuff. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be a real challenge. Like there, there are like hundred, hundred, I mean, it's really hundreds of boards com coming out. And how, how do we support all of that? Um, so, so I think that's the, the question I wanted to, to raise. And maybe that's something we can talk about in, in the both. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm obviously open for questions now. Hi. Hello. Yep. Yeah, so I don't quote me exactly. So um, I believe so Red Hat has this problem as well obviously, and I mean, they're obviously more interested in the ARM64 only server stuff, but I believe the way they're going about it, and maybe it's something we could collaborate on, is they're trying to make sure and push all the vendors to be standardized, because as, as you pointed out so elegantly, it's just non, it's crazy with all the different uh, device tree differences and so on. So I believe their strategy is to uh, work with the vendors and require everything to be upstream and no device tree. Uh, specifically to push everything to just boot with one kernel and so on. So maybe yeah. that could be, uh, you know, we sacrifice a few of these shitty boards, but work with the vendors that make the ones that are, are upstream. Well, so I, I might be mistaken, but as far as I know, uh, Red Hat basically says we only support UEFI and, and ACPI. And, and that's fair enough. Uh, and I think that works for them because that's like the server world, which they care about. But I, I think in, in case of Debian, there are so many boards out there which don't meet those specs. And we sort of live in like the real world. Um, so I don't think we can, well, I mean, it's different. It's, I mean, if Red Hat wants to target you know, the server people, like the people who actually have money, I mean, that's fair enough. That makes sense for them. But Debian, we run everywhere. So I think we need to support the, all those weird cases as well. Um, and, and maybe if it gets too weird, or if, or if I mean, uh, I, I put in some work on the Dragon board, and then I realized, why am I actually spending that time? Because no one, like, I've heard from no one that they have that board. I mean, like, a lot of people have the Raspberry Pi, but I've heard, like, pretty much no one has the, the Dragon board. So maybe I'm, you know, it's not worth why, my while. But if, if there is a board, a board where people, you know, want to use it, I think we should support it in Debian, and we do have the infrastructure. So we, you know, it doesn't have to be UEFI and, and ACPI. We we can support uh, other devices because we have done it before. Um, but but I, but I definitely agree with like the point about getting more standardization and, and that stuff. So um, I, I I agree. Yeah. Um, and the whole I mean the whole distro support in in U-boot that has really made things easier for us. Um, I might be going to say some of the same things Steve was anyway. Um, so yeah, on the um, IP versus DT thing, um, it's more a question of quality of implementation of the um, of the uh, of the firmware and of the upstream support than it is. I mean, DT isn't fundamentally worse 
for upstream support than um, ACP is. Um, Red Hat are have have some reasons for this, varying degrees of sensibility, but um, it's not fundamentally about me. It doesn't fundamentally stop it people supporting it, um, especially in a community distro like Debian. Um, I was also going to uh, ask Martin, have you um, talked to people like Kernel CI about um, the testing and coverage stuff? Yeah, not really, but but I think I think there are some some things we should look into. Yeah, because yeah, the whole obviously the whole making sure the kernel boots on random hardware stuff is exactly what that's doing, mm -hmm. um, and there's at least uh, infrastructure there that might be nice to play with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. So on the whole 96 boards thing, sorry. <laughs> Um, most of the engineers involved are totally aware of how awful it, it mm. really is. We've tried to tell management um, they, w they, they don't want to listen. Yeah. Um, so there's been a huge amount of pushback saying, oh, you know, Will and Noah, we should be do making sure this is all upstream. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm yeah. aware. It's just. It's just Linaro has a has a really good brand, so people expect you know when yeah. I saw oh ninety six boards it's Linaro, so obviously that stuff is going to work, and and that's why I was really disappointed. Well, yeah, what one what one positive thing there is that the first EE board, um, the SOC does basically work upstream already with current upstream. Mm -hmm. It's not like there are some patches still need to go in. Apart mm -hmm. from the PCI, it should basically work. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, hopefully that's going to be a much less spectacular story than the um, consumer yeah. edition boards have yeah. been, because they're unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, the first EE board, the cello board, is due to start shipping really, really soon now. There are examples already out there with engineers for validation. Literally, we're talking the next couple of weeks is what I've mm. been told. Um, that's the first 96 board I would actually spend any time on at all, personally. Mm. Um, the CE boards are a joke. Mm. Um, I'd forgotten what else I was going to say. Oh, yes, and then uh, I guess we'll, go, we'll be going through quite a lot of this again in the old boff later on in, the, um, in terms of which things we support. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll carry on the discussion. Yeah. Um, uh, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, uh, we've gotten all this great support for distro boot command and U-boot, and uh, now they're starting to get to UEFI emulation in U-boot. So even for boards that don't have UEFI emulation or UEFI support, if they support U-boot, uh, it might work. Although that means all the standardization we've worked towards, uh, we throw it away. But, eh. Yes, yeah, so, so I think that's something we need to figure out. Uh, which one do we want to standardize on? Or is that something we want to, do, to leave up to the, the user? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think one, I mean, I guess it was sort of confusing because there are like those different ways, but, but but what I really want to, sh to show is that things are getting much more standardized and much better. Um, so it, it used to be really pretty horrible. And, and nowadays, you know, if, if a platform uses a, a modern U-boot, if, if it has upstream support, then it's, it's actually pretty trivial to, to add Debian support. Um, and, and, and I think that wasn't the case uh, in, in the past. Um, I think Ben had another one. So, so uh, I'm. <laughs> uh, no, I'm uh, interested to know how much, how much interest there is among the ARM porters in uh, graphics support, GPU uh, support, rather than selling sort of dumb frame buffers, um, and how many, how many of these boards? Because quite a lot of them, these boards do have HDMI ports, and I don't know. Uh, to what degree they're actually supported. 
I, uh, I, mean, I have the current project at work, uh, which uh, definitely is using the uh, 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 GPU on our OMAP system, and the what's in Debian is a Debian-based <laughs> Debian system. But the, but the Debian, uh, what's in Debian, does not does not support the GPU. Um, well, so uh, so I can't speak for, for everyone. So I'm, I've, I've personally done some work on the the Tag, Tegra recently, and and Nvidia is actually working upstream mm. on on new vault support. So I'm I'm really interested in in it. Um, but I, I think a lot of the boards use those Mali um, GPUs, and I'm I'm not sure what they. Maybe you can give an update. <laughs> um, can, can we get a microphone for Gene? So on the Mali front, there has been a lot of history of ARM being scared of releasing any of this um, in any way, shape, or form without huge uh, ELA, EULAs and all that kind of stuff. So it's not been redistributable even at all. Um, it, we're a long way from it being releasable free. Um, there, there are packages coming that will, should, be get, should be shippable in non-free at least if you want to get full acceleration on your <coughs> Mali stuff. Um, hopefully that will solve some of the problems. There is a lot, there are a lot of people inside ARM who are very, very keen to support it properly, free and upstream. Um, it's a long fight. It'll take a while. I mean, most of the driver, the Mali driver developers themselves I've spoken to would love to make it free. It just comes down to um, legal people being scared. Mm. Some questions left. Okay. Yeah, thanks for coming. So, and there is going to be the arm um, uh later today, um, and Vagrant is also going to talk about his experience uh, about running a build network on ARM HF board. Thanks. <laughs>